before I launch into my sermon, uh, I do want to give a personal thanks to Crossover for playing this morning. And uh, a thanks to the congregation for doing something new. I know having all the words up on the screens for our hymns and processionals and recessionals and graduals is different. And uh, I know in some cases, maybe we haven't sung some of these for a while. Um, but I do appreciate us give it a, giving it a shot and uh, using some of our musical talent here at Epiphany in a new way today. So thank you, and thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Andrea and I and the girls uh, traveled to California for a family wedding. Actually, a wedding in Pasadena. Yeah, it was a tough assignment. <laughs> But as you've probably heard, um, most of California has been experiencing a major drought for four years now. And the amount of water they are missing there is just kind of mind-boggling. It's 15 million acre feet. Or to put it in a way that maybe is a little easier for us to visualize, if we wanted to fix California's drought, all we would have to do is take the neighboring state of West Virginia, cover it with a foot of water, and send that across the country. Can you imagine that? A foot of water over the entire state of West Virginia. That's how much water they're missing in California. And now life is going on pretty comfortably in Pasadena. I'll, I'll admit that. in and out burgers are still good. <laughs> but I don't think we saw a single sprinkler in operation while we were there. There are signs of this drought, if you know how to look. Another thing I saw, uh, which honestly the last time I saw this was in the Middle East, were gas station signs that were just dusty. You know, there's been so little moisture for so long. Even things like that are covered in dust. And when we were in Pasadena, we drove by the local reservoir. It's Eaton Canyon Reservoir in Pasadena. And not only did it not have any water in it, which I kind of expected, but it had trees growing in the bottom. So now keep that in mind. Keep that California drought in mind. And turn with me now to First Kings. Chapter 17. This is page 299 in the Blue Bibles. And imagine with me, imagine a California scale drought, but in a land without any of the technological advantages that California has, those things that made life basically go on as normal in Pasadena. Imagine a drought in a land that has no seawater desalination plants, has no reservoir system, no canals, no ability to drill wells many hundreds of feet into ancient groundwater like they do in California. And then imagine that instead of this drought being caused by some obscure weather pattern over the Pacific, imagine it is actually caused by a man. One man has brought a California-scale drought on a nation. Because, friends, that's actually what 1 Kings chapter 17 is describing. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, if you're not familiar with Elijah, he's a prophet. That is someone who speaks for God. And Elijah is a prophet at a particularly dark time in the history of Israel. And this Ahab character, he's the king. He's the king of Israel. And not only is he the king, but he is personally responsible for much of the darkness in that country. Verse 29 of chapter 16 here in 1 Kings says this. It says, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Now, of course, uh, if you are a king of Israel, the evil bar is pretty high. So this is quite a statement about this man. And 1 Kings gives some examples. It said he built temples to idols over the entire country. It describes that in chapter 16. And if we skip ahead to chapter 21, it describes how Ahab, with the help of his wife Jezebel, stole land from his own subjects. And when they, when they resented it, he killed them. So this is an evil man who's done evil in this nation. So that's where we find ourselves in the reading. There is a great drought on. It's been going on for three years. And it comes out of the behavior of Ahab and Elijah's response as God's prophet. 
But now Elijah, Elijah's begging for food and water in this little town outside of Israel called Zarephath. So on one hand, God has gotten Ahab's attention here. And it kind of works. But on the other hand, Ahab has responded to what's happened to him by going after the messenger, hasn't he? He has driven Elijah out. Ahab doesn't want to change direction. Instead, Ahab's response to this drought is to want the prophet, to want Elijah dead. And this great, powerful prophet has had to flee his own country, flee Israel. Now, I do have to say, as an aside, there is at least a little bit of me who feels for Ahab in this. Imagine what it would be like if Governor Jerry Brown in California knew exactly who was responsible for the drought over his state. You think he would be on speaking terms with that person. So this is basically another part of the situation that's around our gospel reading this morning. We have Elijah, who is God's prophet, and who has taken action because God directed him to do so. And the person that he has taken action, not so much against, but to get the attention of, has responded with attention, but murderous intention. And now Elijah, who in one sense you can connect to the cause of this drought, is also a victim of it. He's pursued by this angry king. His life is in danger. He has no water. He has nothing to eat. He's outside of his own country. Our passage this morning, starting at verse 8 of chapter 17, shows us that things have become so desperate for Elijah that he is dependent on a foreign widow to keep him alive. A widow that's down to the last little bit of food herself. In other words, friends, while our reading this morning, 1 Kings chapter 17, starting at verse 8, does show us a picture of God taking care of Elijah. We look at the whole story. I think we have to say this is not exactly an advertisement for the material advantages of doing God's will and being a prophet. Without God, it's absolutely true that Elijah would have starved or died of thirst. At the same time, without this drought and Elijah's central part in carrying it out, Elijah himself wouldn't be in this situation. He wouldn't be alone in a foreign country depending on the charity of one of the weakest members of society because he's even weaker than that. Believe it or not, friends, this is where 1 Kings chapter 17 connects with us. You ever feel like Elijah? That is, put in a spot where carrying out God's will means that powerful people are going to give you the stink eye. Put in a spot where doing what you know God desires leaves you with less than when you started. Have you been there? You know, this is not the way we like to talk about doing God's will at church, but it's in the realm of the possible, isn't it? And friends, it's very biblical. There's all kinds of examples of this in Scripture. Friends, Sometimes, sometimes following God's will costs us something, doesn't it? Sometimes it leaves us dependent on others in ways we would rather not be. I always thought uh, this spring, Father Michael gave a great example of this um, as we were doing our annual pledge drive. Remember that? And he he was preaching about this, and he talked about how here at Epiphany, uh, we believe it's God's will that we tithe. We give 10% of our income to support the ministry of the church. And he said, you know, if you do this, let me warn you about something. You will have 10% less money than people at the same income level as you. I've done the math. This works. (laughs) Sometimes when we follow God's will, there are not just benefits. There are also costs that are involved. So in the past, I know I have talked about how this shouldn't surprise us. If you come to Epiphany with any kind of regularity, it's probably clear to you by now that I am not a very big fan of the idea that doing God's will means that we will be automatically rewarded by the things we want, by honor and success and power and money. That idea, which is a popular idea out there, that 
Blank's doing what God wants with material reward has a name. It's called the prosperity gospel. Have you heard that? And I find, I find this prosperity gospel to be very different than the real gospel, which is that Jesus, and by the way, did God's will perfectly, did not become rich or powerful as the world measures these things, but instead suffered and died for our sins and was resurrected, and now advocates for us, not that we get a new car or a fat bank account, but that our sins would be forgiven at God's right hand in glory. Honestly, I also find the prosperity gospel very different than reality as I have experienced it. It's true that on one hand, living as a Christian does help us, has certainly helped me not to act in self-destructive ways, because I understand for what I was made for and for whom I was made, and does give me, and I hope gives all of us, a hope-filled view of the world because we know the end of the story. No matter how messy the middle is that we're in right now, those things are true, and I hope they're true for you as well because they can be. But it is, at the same time, absolutely false that being a Christian means our troubles melt away or that we get a raise or that our families suddenly become perfect. At least my family doesn't. But exploring this in more detail this morning, it's not actually where I'm going to go. I want to go to a related point. Kind of the other side of the coin of the prosperity gospel. And it's simply this. Why isn't it true? Why aren't we rewarded when we walk in God's will and human things? Why does God, so to speak, do this to us? Why does God take Elijah and make him a prophet and give him all kinds of power and authority? Controlling the weather is no small thing. I would like that trick. But then demand that he uses it not to be happy and loved and rich and powerful, but to begin a chain of events that leaves him in exile from his own country and at the mercy of a starving widow. Why does God do this? Give us commands to follow patterns for living that at least some part of the time seem to make our situation harder instead of easier. Ever wondered that? I'm going to suggest two answers. The first is pretty simple, friends. It's not actually God who makes things difficult for us when we follow his will. And secondly, God has a way of giving us what we need when we need it, but not before, if we are willing to have faith and follow him particularly when we have faith and follow him in the face of hardship, hardship that we can see. We can actually see both of these answers illustrated for us in the story of Elijah here in 1 Kings chapter 17. And we'll begin with the responsibility piece. Is this something God is doing? Because I do think it's easy. It's easy for me sometimes to blame, to blame God when it seems like I'm being punished for doing his will. But here's the truth, friends. It's not God's problem. God wasn't really Elijah's problem, was he? It was Ahab. You almost call blaming the victim. It was Ahab who, instead of getting the memo and getting right with God at the beginning of this drought, has tried to chase Elijah down as though he were the source of his difficulties. And actually, this is talked about if you turn ahead to chapter 18. Elijah runs into one of Ahab's servants, a man named Obadiah. And Obadiah tells Elijah this. He says, There is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And believe me, friends, he is not seeking Elijah to give him a birthday card. And we see the same things in our lives, don't we? God doesn't punish us for doing what he asks, but sometimes other people don't like it very much. In the end, much of the hardship and static we face when we follow God simply a function of the fact that we live in a world that's imperfect and is sinful and full of imperfect and sinful people. You know, friends, a lot of the time we're among them. This is not some kind of strange scheme where God makes bad things happen to people who do his will because he's some sort of heavenly sociopath. In fact, given, given that people are the way they are and the world is the way it is, by the way, there's this wonderful quote I love about Christian doctrine, and it says, the doctrine of original sin is the only one that can be empirically proven. 
and it's true, we should expect, expect a certain amount of hardship to come when we do God's will. This is something Jesus predicts repeatedly. I was talking to someone after the first service, and they said, this is one of the promises of God. I hadn't quite thought about it that way, but I think that's right. Look at John 16, verse 33. In this world you will have tribulation, that is, suffering and trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the first thing, first thing to keep in mind. The price we sometimes pay for doing God's will is not the price that God is charging, but a sign, a sign of the imperfect, sinful world we live in. Secondly, God has a way, a way of giving us what we need, when we need it, even, and I think even especially, when we face real costs for doing his will. While Ahab hunts for Elijah in the midst of this drought-struck land, God, in 1 Kings chapter 17, first sends him to a safe water source, a brook, and provides food for him. And when Ahab is so stubborn that this drought goes on to such a point that even that brook dries up, God provides another place for Elijah with this widow, this town of Zarephath, and again provides food and water for him miraculously. Friends, while the prosperity gospel is not the real gospel, doing God's will is not an automatic gateway to riches and power. Scripture's consistent evidence my own experience is that there is no better way to see God's miraculous care for us than by doing his will when it costs us something. And actually, friends, I think that is a lesson that we have learned here at Epiphany. Today, believe it or not, is our fourth annual meeting after our exodus from our old building at 3301 Hidden Meadow Drive. As a church, we did our best to follow God's will in the decisions that led up to that leave-taking. Many of us were there. You remember those prayers, those conversations, those decisions. And when it comes to material possessions, what ministries are now possible or not possible for us, even to the size of our congregation, in certain ways we have suffered for that decision, haven't we? But at the same time, and I want those of you who were there particularly to remember this, and tell people that weren't there, remember that through that loss, we saw God's care for us, his provision for us, to use a church word, so clearly and repeatedly. I remember thinking that spring of 2012, as God met our seemingly impossible financial needs, and then met our need for a temporary space, and that met our need for a temporary, temporary space, when that temporary space wasn't available on a Sunday, and then tossed this current building into our lap in a way that I can't quite go through the old story right now, but it was pretty miraculous. I just remember thinking how amazing it was to see firsthand in our lives all the things that the Bible says about God caring for his people. They're true. God gave us a brook in our dry land. He led us to a widow in Zarephath. Because as a church, we did our best to follow him, even at real, real cost in this imperfect and sinful world. The same is true for each of us, each of us as we walk through our own lives. Doing what God wants us to do on one hand is not a ticket to everything suddenly going our way. Far from it. But it is the best way I know to see God bless us by giving us what we need when we need it. And friends, that is such a great thing to see. So friends, do you ever feel like Elijah, like you are paying a price for doing God's will? Take heart. Trust God. Don't turn back. God loves his people. He loves you. And he will take care of you, even, even when it seems there is a drought in King Ahab at the door. Amen.